Hello, listeners. Jordan here. I just want to let you know that you can listen to Nighttime early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Include it with Prime. You are listening to the Nighttime Podcast. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to my multi-part series covering the death of Injustice 4, Sia Van Wyck. So far in our exploration of Sia's story, we've met her parents, Eric and Effie, and viewed this unimaginable tragedy from each of their perspectives. In each of those discussions, references were made to the tractor operator's dysfunctional relationship with some members of his community, but I think it's been quite understated. I hinted into what you're going to learn about in this episode at the very beginning of this series. Remember that video I described of Mr. Potter driving his tractor like a maniac and tearing up what appears to be his neighbor's lawn? Call 911. This clip is one of many that Brandy filmed of the man she refers to as the neighbor from hell. But to be fair, Potter probably doesn't like her much either. But the fact of the matter is that only one of them seems comfortable using a large tractor to intimidate the other. I'll let you decide how relevant Potter's bizarre fixation with property lines is to the death of Sia Van Wyck. But I think Brandy's history with this man tells us a lot of what we need to know about him. So let's get into it. In this discussion, Brandy Parker will join us for a discussion about the neighbor she claims has been terrorizing her and her family for years. And we'll talk about the child he killed in his field, seven-year-old Sia Van Wyck. Seven-year-old Sia Van Wyck was full of life and adventure. She was playing in a neighbor's hayfield in Clementsvale near Digby on July 19th when she was struck by a piece of farm machinery. Sia died hours later from her injuries. Brandy Parker, I, I think you play a really interesting part in this whole story where through your videos and, you know, your experiences that you've shared with uh with roland potter i I think i've i have a completely different outlook on this entire story but before we get into your story and your experiences tell me a little bit about you who are you where do you live and how did you like get drawn into this whole mess um well my name is brandy parker and i live in uh clementsville nova scotia and i work at a, a private addictions treatment facility i'm a licensed practical nurse um, I have two teenage boys. Well, I guess actually, sorry, one of them's an adult now. He's 19 and oh the other my. one's 17. So he still lives at home. Mm-hmm. Um, and how I got into this whole thing is I just bought the wrong house. Mm. Um, I don't know how else to say it. Like I bought this house in 2014. Um, I moved in on my birthday and I was incredibly excited because it's the first home I've, I've ever owned on my own. And it actually, um, it used to belong to my aunt and uncle when I was a little girl. So I have like a lot of memories from being in this home, you know, from the time I was about, could remember till eight years old. So it held a lot of sentimental value. Um, My kids, they're boys. They love dirt bikes. They love four wheelers. I just wanted to give them a place where they could just be boys. And it turned into an absolute living nightmare. Um... My problems with Roland Potter started, I bought the house in 2014. Everything was kind of good for about that first year. And then in 2016, it just blew up into this crazy life that we live here. Yeah, crazy is a good way to describe it. Now, you you mentioned family owned the home before you. Were you aware of any problems they had with the neighbor? Or did you even know the neighbor before you moved in? Mr. Potter? Um, I, I knew of him. I didn't know who they were specifically. Like I had never, I can't say that I'd ever met him in person, but being in such a small community, it's likely that I've ran into him or I mm-hmm. saw his wife. Mm-hmm. Um, there was one person who just kind of said, you know, you, I, I knew the right away. So I guess I should explain that. So Roland, um, he has a legal right away through my property because he owns the field behind me okay um so in order to 
well, he has another access, but he tends to use my my property to get there. So to get to his field, he has a legal right of rig right of way going through my driveway mm -hmm. and um i i didn't really know like no i i really didn't know it was as crazy as could be i knew he was yeah. kind of a you know I, I hate to say cranky old man because that's very stereotypical but you know that's kind of the way it was described to me and i spent 17 years working in long-term care and i just kind of said to myself well i can deal with cranky people and mm -hmm. i'll bake him some bread and everything will be fine mm, that um, is certainly not that, how it turned out that yeah. is not how it turned out at all but but the way you're describing it it wasn't the kind of thing where you were moving to this house being like i just gotta watch you know be careful around the neighbor because no, he's no he's no enough. no no yeah. I, I never thought that for a second it didn't cross my mind that i would have um a huge huge issue with my neighbors no yeah no you mentioned that you lived in the home for a few years with your family before any trouble started do you, do you recall what started this rift between i know you and exactly potter? what started it between me and mr potter and it was literally i moved in september 25th of 2014 and the following winter so where we share the driveway um and mr potter has um like farm equipment like he has a backhoe he has a tractor he has a horse trailer not to mention um the field is open to his friends and family to go hunting so there's a lot of traffic that first year up and down my driveway mm -hmm. um and so basically what happened is the driveway became extremely rutted um my stepdad thankfully i have a very supportive family um my stepdad fixed the driveway with his tractor and some um slate and it did cost around five or six hundred dollars to repair it mm -hmm. the winter before um i had paid mr potter to plow the driveway so he would come across the road i'd give him twenty dollars um i provided him with some lobster fish that i'd gotten from my brother and that sort of thing like just as a nice gesture um, once I had to repair the driveway the next summer, um, I had sent Vivian, his wife, a message on Facebook. And I was very, I thought, um, reasonable about it. I just said, you know, like, I, I understand that you guys need the driveway for your, your business and for your, your livelihood. Um, I had to pay this much money this summer to fix it. I was wondering, like, would it be possible for us to share the upkeep of the driveway? Could roll and plow it this winter? Like, do, do I have to pay? They lost their minds. Like he lost his mind. He came over here. He yelled and screamed at me and told me if I couldn't pay $20 to upkeep the driveway, then I should move out of Clemensvale. Like it was just the most bizarre conversation from this, you know, I think at the time he was probably about 73, 74. And I'm just standing there and I'm like, okay, this man is screaming his head off at me. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take that. So I said, okay, fine. Don't plow my driveway. I will get someone else to plow it. And that's exactly what I did. And the first time the person came over to plow it, Roland came over and you might hear some bad language in this. You might have to beep out. <laughs> um, he came over and like got my plow guy out of the tractor and told my plow guy that he would never get his money. And I was nothing but a rotten bitch. And that from there, it just went downhill. Oh my God. Like every contractor, every person I have ever had into my home, to work on it um like if i had to do excavator work they've called environment canada on me i had to reroute um some of my septic system which was approved by my insurance company when i bought the house like they've called the dog catcher on me i've gotten a letter from every uh basically municipal and provincial and federal government agency that you can possibly think of connected to my home to do some sort of investigation wow that, yeah, so that, that, that's literally what started it. And it just escalated from him yelling to him becoming incredibly violent and trying to kill my mom. Yeah, and, and we'll get to that because um, it's, you know, this story, like it, it right now what you're describing just sounds like the case of like the neighbor from hell. But mm -hmm. what ha what happens here, of course, is completely, well, I, I guess when, when someone has the neighbor from hell, they kind of fear that it could turn into what, your story and what this story has turned into so th this all starts between you and the potters several years before sia enters the picture uh, yes it does yeah and leading up to that like in if you can maybe just give me an idea of you know in the, in the couple years before 2017 when uh, when sia's death occurs how often was it you would have been connected with pot with the potters how often were you hearing from them were you fearing that you know they were going to escalate it to the point of you know physical harm like what was the situation um, like so that that first year like i said it was it was pretty low-key um like roland actually helped me install um uh 
a telephone pole and he put the now that we've come to discover through the property line dispute he put the telephone pole on property that he thinks is his but or not a telephone pole i'm sorry a clothesline pole okay he helped put a clothesline pole in um so like that first year um the interactions i had with them were literally you know if he was driving up the driveway in the tractor i would say hello you know like we it was it was pretty reasonable that first year. Um, and then just, you know, sp- sporadically and from like 2016 into 2017, um, I can remember one particular incident where um, he he came over and I, I don't know what led to him being so angry. I think I was outside mowing the lawn out, the, out back in the dispute of property. And um, he just came over and he was, you know, screaming and yelling at me. And at the time, um, my boyfriend kind of sent me inside and said, like, I'll handle this. And <sighs> so I guess that first year, it was just these really random sporadic moments where, you know, we would be outside either working in the garden or puttering around, just doing things that you do at home. And he would just come over and yell at me over this property line and trying to tell me that the property line was, you know, about eight feet off the back of my house. And and in my mind, I'm just like, okay, I'll, I'll just let him yell and scream at me, whatever. Like, I can handle being yell and screamed at. This He'll just eventually go away. And that's kind of how the first year went. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in 2017, um, when Sia's story starts, I actually wasn't living in my house at that point in time. I had gone to Alberta. My kids and I had moved out there, but it only lasted for a few months. And we ended up coming home that October. Okay. So from June till October of 2017, I wasn't actually here. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's maybe for the better. Yeah. So okay. um, anyway, so be, for that time, I came home in October of 2017 and things were well relatively quiet through the winter. Like the way it would start it off is it seemed to be the spring and summer months, you know, like when Roland was really accessing the field and coming through the driveway that he had problems with us and then it would snow and there wouldn't be an issue. Mm-hmm. Um, so... I actually, like, I came back to my home and and I was aware of, you know, what the media had printed about Sia, but I didn't know anything else. Like, I had never spoken with her family. I hadn't met them. I wasn't here. I didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. Um, And then in 2018, um, my children, my my oldest son to be exact, um, he purchased a dirt bike. And he was driving the dirt bike, like, up and down our driveway. He was not. I I told him, like, do not go into Roland's field. Don't even go past where he says that the property is his because I don't want any trouble. And that's what my son did. He would just go around the driveway, up and down, you know, um occasionally i'm not gonna lie i was at work and he probably did sneak a couple hundred feet up to the dirt road beside us to go for a cruise on his dirt bike that's why we live in the country Mm -hmm. um and i was at work one day and this is before i ever had any connection with sia's parents um i was at work and i got a call from my kids and they said it was uh right around july 24th or 25th of 2018 Mm -hmm. and they said uh roland was they said drunk with their, you know, they were 10 and 12 years old, roughly. And he was at the end of the driveway, like across the road. Like, so my, basically when you go out my driveway, if you walk across the road, you're going to walk into Roland's driveway to where he actually lives. Yeah. So he was on his property by the road and he was screaming at my sons. And he told my son that he was going to wait till we were all asleep, bring his backhoe over, knock our house down and kill us all. Okay. So my son calls me and I'm like, okay, well, I'm at work. I, I, I'm a nurse. You can't just leave. And there was nothing going on. Like Roland was still across the road. So I called my mom who only lived about six minutes away at the time. And my mom came over. And by the time my mom come over, like Roland was still across the road, kind of yelling. And my kids were on the deck and they stopped uh, driving the dirt bikes around. And another um, older gentleman, which um, Roland is friends with, he then came onto the property and, you know, started screaming at my mom and my kids and told my mom and my kids that Roland had called the the Mounties. The Mounties were coming. And my mom's kind of like, well, for what? Like, what what did they do wrong? And they, there was just kind of a yelling. And my, my mom's a pretty, pretty tough lady. And she sent this guy packing across the road. And <laughs> So she thought, well, if cops are coming, you know, that my, my sons, I guess they were probably 12 and 14 by then. My sons, you know, she didn't want to leave them to deal with the cops. So my, they were all sitting here on the deck, on the balcony, like out front where the driveway is and, and just kind of waiting to see what would happen and waiting for me to get home from work. Well, before the police ever came, Roland came over with the backhoe 
um, kind of drove around out back. Like it, it, I had the, I've seen the video footage. I wasn't here, but, but judging from the video footage, you can tell that he was either intoxicated, really super mad, or just had no idea how to drive a backhoe because it was absolutely insane. And then he parks it about maybe I'm, I'm not good with distance, but I want to say by the time he started digging, like by the time he put the stabilizers down and he would reach out with the bucket of the, of the backhoe, it was maybe six to eight feet off the back of my house. And he just started digging erratically, like digging up the lawn. And uh, so my mom, of course, by this point, my mom phoned the police um, and Roland had never actually called the police. The police came out. Oh, um, they charged him with mischief. We entered into a peace bond. They told us we had to get a survey. Like there was just so many things that came out of this one incident that cost so much money and so much time and energy and in the end, Roland was found not guilty because mm -hmm. he was his intent. This is the Canadian law. His intent was to show us where the property line was. Oh my um, God. That's the that's what they came up with? That's what they came up with. And I so I'm sitting in the courtroom and I'm asking myself, okay, so if I wanted to show somebody where my property line was, why wouldn't I just get out and walk? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you point know, down like it's here rather than, yeah, you know, like, this, screaming this from my tractor right below my feet. I, like, I It was just it was so insane. And like things just escalated from there. Vivian stole my wood. She admitted in court that it was my wood. She was found not guilty because some color of right law in Canada. Roland was locked up in jail for actually telling the police that he was going to shoot us and leave our bodies laying on the lawn. He was found not guilty for that. Like. I, wow. There are so many incidents that it's just I've I can kind of start at in in 2017 and give a semi chronological order of events. But it's just but too much. Eh? It's just so 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 much. The incident you just described with uh, the tractor digging up your lawn and all this that that's what. I've seen that video and that's been shared widely and it's it's horrifying to see that. I thought it was you in the video, but it's your mom who's, who's no, yelling to call that, the police. Yes, that's my mom, the, um, okay. the, lady, the lady with the tattoos who, who was uh, telling him to get and the one who called 911. That's okay, my mom. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, and, and that incident is what leads to the to the peace bond, which I was, that was something I was going to ask you is how you ended up engaged, uh, like having a peace bond against yeah, him. Yeah, so that makes well, sense. Um, so basically what happened was this the summer of 2018, there were so many incidents and I kept calling the RCMP and I kept getting this answer that we didn't have any evidence. We didn't have any evidence. Um, there was actually an incident where Vivian, um, Roland's wife, Roland was standing on the lawn. There, there became a point in time with my son with the dirt bike where like mm -hmm. they just kept calling the cops on him. They just would not stop, call, stop calling the cops. So I said, Simon, okay. I know the Potter Road, it's about 200 feet away, Like, but just push it up the road. Just put the dirt bike, push the dirt bike up the road. Maybe that will stop them calling the cops on you, you know, and technically it is illegal, so you shouldn't do it. So he started pushing his dirt bike up the road and Vivian got in the farm truck and chased him with it, swerved at him. He had to jump in the ditch and the dirt bike fell on top of him. Wow. She swerved at him with a truck. I phoned the police and they told me to get my son a GoPro. To, oh, wow, to, to arc, yeah, this is shocking. Couldn't lay any charges, mm -hmm. you know. And then that same summer, my kids were um, target shooting with pellet guns at another little neighbor boy's house. Pellet guns. Mm -hmm. They called the RCMP and told the cops that my kids were shooting long rifles, and they sent three carloads of cops in riot gear with wow. assault rifles after my kids in Clemensvale, Nova Scotia. Yet I've called 911 once before and they didn't show up. They phoned me three hours later to ask me if I was okay. Wow. Now, uh, I want to back up a bit in this. And you mentioned you were living away when when Sia was killed. Do you recall like learning that this had happened and that there was an incident related to Potter? And, and can you tell me about the kind of your thoughts when you heard that he had killed a, you know, a five-year-old with his tractor? I, re I remember it very vividly, actually, because um, being a small town and people text messaging and that sort of thing, I got the wrong details. And I actually thought that one of um, the boy's friends who lives up the road, that it was one of their, their little 
sisters who had gotten killed in the field. Oh. And I couldn't, it didn't make sense to me. I couldn't understand like why this particular child was in the field. Um, but then eventually, yes, I, I did learn about it and I was absolutely devastated. You know, it didn't matter what, whose child it was. It would just, mm. yeah, I, I remember that day very vividly. I said five-year-old, I meant seven-year-old. But when um, when you, so you first hear the news that, again, it, at first you thought it was a different a different child that was killed. But when you heard that Potter was the one behind the wheel or whatever of the tractor in control of the tractor, what did you think happened? Like, did, did it concern My you? first instinct was he was drunk and he ran her over. Um, and, you know, as the story developed and, and I found more things out, you know, my idea of what happened did change. And, you know, like, I, I'm like you, like, at, at first, I, I kind of thought, like, okay, he's, you know, poor judgment, like, he, I don't know if he woke up in the morning and said, I'm going to go out and kill this little girl today. Mm -hmm. um, but as things progressed with my family, and as I saw how he taught how he treated my children, I'm have a completely different view on what happened that day than what was portrayed in the media and what the potters would like you to believe. Yep, certainly. And in and, in part, like my opinion and my thoughts on all this were heavily uh, swayed by the videos that you published. Like I first saw the ones that you had on YouTube, which are like uh, Potter on a rampage in his tractor, like digging up your yard. But then when I found your TikTok, I'm seeing videos of like, there's one where Potter's like a, a, across a field and he's yelling at your son, like seemingly trying to challenge him to a fight, mm -hmm. cursing yes. at him. I don't think they're supposed to be talking to me. Pretty sure we have a restored or order against them. Uh, I was just riding my dirt bike around in the driveway pretty peacefully. And this old man came out and started yelling at me like he has done many other fucking times. Pardon my language, but I am kind of pissed off. He just called me a fucking coward. He's not supposed to be talking to me. Look at them, both standing out there, harassing me. Like they do every day, waving their arms, yelling at us, everything. I'm sick and tired of it. Something's got to be done about this. Which is just, you know, the idea of that is just horrifying and shocking. And then when you consider what this man had done uh, with the, with the tractor, it just you know, changes my view. But one video in particular that gives a strong opinion on Potter is I, I think it's him. And I, I will, I'll use the word attacking. It's, he seems to be attacking your mom. I think it's your mom with his tractor. Yes, what, that, what... Was, um, that was not um, this past summer, but the summer before that. And again, I was at work. Yeah, because for um, someone who hasn't seen the video, what it looks like to me is your mom is kind of like ducking down behind a rock, and it seems like he's uh, lifting up the bucket of his tractor, kind of bringing it down on her. Yeah, what the I, hell I happened? Can tell you, I can I can tell you what happened that day. So my mom and I, we actually both at this at the time we were working in the same nursing home, and mm -hmm. I was scheduled seven to seven, and my mom was scheduled seven to three, like daytime, at seven a.m. to seven p.m. seven a.m. to seven three p.m. Um, and my son, who he he just turned 17, so he would have been um, 15 at the time. He was outside working on his cars on our property, mm -hmm. um, not near the property line dispute. Like we, other than me mowing the property that's in dispute and cleaning it up, we try to stay off of it as much as possible. Like we only use it, you know, to put wood in the house and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So my son was outside working, and Roland went up in behind the field where Sia was killed and he started to bring down these giant boulders with his backhoe and dropping them um, on what he believes to be the property line basically and and while he was doing this you know he would open the door and he'd yell at my son he'd go up and get another rock he'd bring it down and he'd open the door and he'd yell at my son so finally my son called me at work and he said you know mom like uh, we call him Snooky. that's his his nickname is Snooky's mm -hmm. around the community so he says mom Snooky, this is what he's doing so I called the cops from work and I said, you know, like, this is what's happening before my son gets injured or, you know, this escalates. Can you please go out and, and deal with what's going on? And they said, well, we'll call you back. So they called me back and they said, you know, he's not doing anything wrong. He's just putting some boulders on a property line. You know, like that's that's basically it. Um, he's he's I'm like, well, what about the fact he's harassing my son? Like you, there's been incidents. The man has told the cops he's going to shoot us all and leave our bodies laying on the lawn. Like, why aren't you going out 
to deal with this. Like we, and so they were just basically said, no, there's nothing we can do. Well, it was so close to three o'clock and my mom getting off work, um, that my mom would just said, you know, that's it. I'm going to your house. I'll deal with it. So when she got to the house and there's a lot of people out there that would probably disagree with her actions after this, but you have to realize that by this point in time, we had been being harassed for, I want to say four years. Um, so 20, yeah, roughly four years. So at this point in time, we'd been harassed for four years. We've got absolutely no help from the justice system. We don't get help from the RCMP. I've actually had RCMP refuse to come out to deal with us. Um, I've been told they want me to stop calling. So my mom comes and she says, I'm going to move the rocks with my truck. So oh. she's 63, she's 63 years old at this point in time. She's had one knee replaced. She needs another knee replaced. She's unarmed. She's five foot two. And she probably weighed about 135 or 140 pounds. So my mom backs her truck up and they're basically hooking up the chains like for her truck. They're putting a chain on these rocks and they have every intention of towing the rocks back down to Roland's Field. And it literally is, I hate to say it, a pissing match. That's, by, mm -hmm. that's what it was at this point in time because the police would not come and help us. So my mom's hooking up the rocks. Roland's getting like fury and mad because mom's moving the rocks. And like there's, I have the entire video, I've watched it in court. It's about 25 minutes long from start to finish. Um, there's incidents where Roland is, he puts the backhoe bucket down and he pushes the giant boulders at my family. Um, he drives, there, there's a bunch of kids here. I call them my family just because they've been hanging around my house for years, but they're, they're my boys. Um, so one of the boys, um, he, he, Roland actually puts the backhoe bucket down and he drives into him with it. Um, he doesn't, you know, drive into him enough that he's going to physically harm him, but it was enough to nudge him and knock him off his feet as, as if to say, you know, keep it up, you know, keep mm -hmm. moving those rocks and you guys are going to get hurt. Um, at one point in the video, my mom bends down to put um, a chain around a boulder and Roland intentionally puts the backhoe bucket down, drives it over to my mom's head and he, he releases it so it goes into the downward motion. Mm -hmm. And my son pulls my mom out of the way. Just if, if he hadn't have moved her, the backhoe bucket at the very least would have taken the skin off of her face. Like she, she would not be okay today. There's no way she would have been hit anywhere on her head with that backhoe and survived and been able to tell the story about it. Wow. And, and now this whole incident, of course, it's caught on film. You publish it to YouTube and I think TikTok. Eventually, yeah. this this leads to, you, you've got also mentioned watching it in court. So this leads to some kind of legal motion. Was he yeah, charged? So, what was he charged with for this? Okay. So what, what actually happened was, um, you know, in that video too, Roland chases the children around my mom's truck with a backhoe. Mm -hmm. The backhoe at at different times, um, the front wheels come off the ground. Um, you can see that its engine is being revved. You can see that it's being driven in a dangerous manner. And when, when the when he drove the backhoe bucket at my mom's head and my son pulled her out of the way, one of the other boys picked up a rock off the ground and he threw it. And when he did, it broke the backhoe window. It wasn't actually my family who called the cops. My family, we, we have given up calling cops. There's no point in calling cops. They don't help. They don't come. They, and, and, and when they do come, all that happens is I waste hours and hours of lost time at work in a courtroom where Mr. Potter's found not guilty. Mm -hmm. So my family didn't call the cops. Vivian, Mr. Potter's wife, called the cops to report that this, that this boy had broken the backhoe window with a rock. Wow. So when the police came, and at this point in time, like, there's a lot of video footage that's just Vivian and Snooky sitting in their tractor, or in the backhoe, sorry, and my family just kind of hang around my mom's truck. And um, so the police come, and they... Vi they they go to deal with Vivian. They, like, and as I wasn't here, so I'm getting like a, a mm -hmm. you know from the videos and from what people are telling me what happened. So somewhere along the lines, um, my family are like you know is like, did they tell you why we threw the rock? And mm -hmm. once they said why we threw the rock, and they came in and they viewed my video surveillance because that's another thing. I live in rural Nova Scotia in Clemensville, and I had to get 24 hour video surveillance around my home to provide evidence to the cops. Mm -hmm. um, so once they came in to see the video of what happened, the cops actually um, charged Roland. He I believe he had three counts of assault with a weapon, which I didn't agree with because he drove a backhoe bucket at my mom's head. I 
feel like that should have at least been attempted murder. Mm -hmm. Um, Three counts of breaching conditions, because I believe at the time he was still under court-ordered conditions not to have contact with either of my sons or my mom. There were eight charges in total. So there was three assault with a weapon, um, a dangerous driving, three breaches of conditions, and um, I can't quite remember what the Mm. last one was, to be honest with you, but I know there were eight charges in total in that one. Wow. Um, Yeah. Just when you you know what he did to Sia and what happened with Sia, just hearing that all of this stuff it just gives such a different picture of it. Like it's, you know, mm-hmm. uh, where people, if you just read the news stories about Sia, it, it comes across as, you know, a, a tragic accident in a it field. Does. But uh, what I was saying to uh, to Sia's dad, Eric, is like, uh, if, um, let's say if I uh, slipped on ice uh, driving my car and, and uh, killed a child with my vehicle, that'd be one thing. But if I also had this background of, you know, drag racing my car on the street where this happened for years and terrorizing people and speeding around the street, you know, it would give a different, like give people a different view of, you know, what happened that day that I slid on the ice. In mm-hmm. this case, like when I, when I hear all this, it's just shocking to me that he's able to get away with this over and over again. And he doesn't seem to have much trouble doing it because with this situation, with all these charges uh, related to attacking your mom and family with the with his backhoe, did he not represent himself at that trial and win? He's, he's represented himself at two different trials, actually. And, so, and it's not him representing himself. It's his wife speaking for him. Okay. Um, and it, it is really, really interesting to watch this stuff happen because if you were to go and speak with Roland, Roland would pretend, sorry, I'm judging. Roland would tell you that he can't hear you. He's deaf. Mm -hmm. Um, you need to speak louder. He doesn't understand. But in the courtroom, when it comes time for him to listen to what my family is saying or for him to respond and, and answer questions, he has no trouble hearing anything. Um, so Vivian actually speaks for him, um, and both times they represented themselves, and both times um, he was found not guilty. He, he's, to my knowledge, he's been found guilty of one thing, and I, I calculated here a while back, and I, I've came up with 17 charges um, related to my family, and then also to um, a, a boy, a, fr- a boy who's um, friends with my boys, but he actually happens to be a relative of Roland's. So okay. there, I think there's 17 charges in total related to Roland and he was found guilty of a technical breach and to this day I still have no idea what a technical breach is wow and this hasn't like despite the passage of time the peace bond these different court motions 17 charges what's the present day situation there like like I'm assuming you're not having him over for tea anytime soon what's going on now Um, so currently Roland is still on conditions that he's not allowed within 50 meters of any boundary line of my property, except for the front road, like the front piece that would be, that would go on the Clemensville road. So that means, um, technically he's not allowed in the field where Sia was killed because he cannot get to it without going within 50 meters of my property line. Mm -hmm. Um, so this past September, my, my 19 year old son was moving to Alberta and before he left, he was, uh, repairing the back roof, which would be very, very close to the disputed property. So it took my son, who is an amazing roofer to take, to do one side of my roof. It took him an entire week. Vivian, between Roland and Vivian, they did, did nothing but drive up here. He my, my roof is super steep. Mm-hmm. Vivian would come up in the tractor and stop and drive back up, then go ahead, then back up, then go ahead, open the door, yell at him while he's up on the roof. So let and then call him back down. Like it was just it was a week from absolute hell to the point like I finally said, Okay, this is enough. You're not gonna ruin my last week with my son before he travels off to Alberta. So I, I, I was calling the cops. And actually, to be honest with you, the only reason I knew that he was still on conditions from the courts is because victim services finally called me. So it was back in August when he was found not guilty for all of these charges related to the back incident with my mom. And I was told by the Crown prosecutor, by the cops, by every judicial person I asked that there were no more conditions, that Roland Potter was free to roam the earth and he could come as close to my property as he wanted. And I thought, well, this is just 
fabulous. So all summer long, we spent the entire summer just being super vigilant, you know, keeping the dogs out of the driveway, um, you know, not just basically trying to keep the peace because every time we do with something over here, it doesn't matter what it is. If we start a car, they're over there yelling at us. I can't even go outside and work in the garden because he calls me names and yells at me. And it's just, it's horrible. Um, So victim services called me to tell me about these conditions. And I'm like, what do you mean conditions? I was told that there was no conditions um, with Roland. So that's when they explained that, yes, he was still on the conditions within the 50 meters. He couldn't come within 50 meters of my boundary lines because there were some breach charges and they hadn't been, um, they hadn't actually gone to court yet. So those, those breach charges are like next year, 2023 sometime. So Mm -hmm. I kept calling the police. They came out, they, um, they laid a few charges and basically after, you know, a few times of me calling, they said, listen, we're just going to serve him with a paper and he's going to have to go before a judge and explain why he keeps breaching. No one has called me to update me on that. All I know is the conditions are still there. And so what Roland does is when he thinks that we're not home, he sneaks up and down. He uses my driveway when we're not home or if he, like if the vehicles aren't here, like maybe my son might have taken my truck so he doesn't think I'm home, he'll come up the driveway. And I'm I'm not going to lie, I've given up calling and reporting it unless some unless we're in imminent danger. I'm not calling the RCMP anymore because it has taken so much of my time, my energy to get absolutely nowhere. No, I, I have a few more questions for you. One, one sure. is why, like, how do you think he's able to get away with this? Like what you're describing to me, I couldn't imagine my neighbor in my relationship being like that. And I just feel like it would have to be shut down by police or something. But in your case, this has been going on for years. There's a dead yeah. seven year old. There's countless videos. You have a huge mm-hmm. following on TikTok showing off this you know dispute like how is he able to get away with this what is so special about it well i i I don't i've gone through so many different scenarios in my head um and sometimes i think like brandy this is this is movie stuff like (laughs) this stuff only happens in the movies people don't pay off judges people don't pay off cops people don't do this and and i'm like well maybe they do Mm. you know or you know, maybe he has a friend like uh, right down. Uh, and the reason I think of some of this stuff, um, partly like my my I had a survey done, had to have a survey done to say that um, to basically say which property I owned and whether or not he was committing these acts on my property or his. He had a counter survey done. His survey <laughs> was done by a man locally whom we all know that he they've been friends for years They've worked together back in the 70s in the woods. And this man went to court and he told the police that, or the, the, the judge that he had never met Roland Potter until he did his survey. Wow. <laughs> you know, so and the, but then there are times when they explain things to me in court and I find out why he's found not guilty. Um, some of it just boils down to the excuse my language, bullshit Canadian laws. Mm-hmm. You know, like the reason he was found not guilty for um what the reason I was given that he was found not guilty for driving the backhoe bucket at my mom is protection of property. He believed those boulders were his. My mom was trying to move them. So him driving his backhoe at my mom's head is a reasonable act. He was defending his property. So, so, so like I, I have so many trouble. I, I, I have a lot of difficulty figuring it out because sometimes I think there's something super sinister and shady going on behind it and he's paying somebody somewhere. And then sometimes I think this is just Canada. Like the the justice system is designed to protect the criminals. And then I think, well, maybe it's a little bit of both. Mm. Like I, I don't know what makes him so special. I know in the community, like personally, from talking to other people, the community itself is fearful of him. I have had people come to me and say, I wish I could help you. I wish I could speak out. I wish I could tell you what happened to me, but I'm scared. I've had people come and tell me, I used to own this house. I moved out, let it go to the bank because I thought he was going to run my children over. I've had, my mom has had people who are friends with him. And unfortunately, this man has died. Uh, go to my mom's and say, I I was there when Roland said he was going to kill your grand, your granddaughter or your grandchildren and your daughter. But I can't say anything because I'll be next. Wow. So I, I guess one of my questions was going to be if you think potter is a nuisance or actually dangerous but i think uh i think i know your answer to that you 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 aren't surprised i don't believe that someone came uh someone 
ended up in harm's way as a result oh, of his actions. Oh gosh, no. Um, I, I definitely, I most definitely like. I tried to for a very long time. Um, I guess downplay my situation, and I think a lot of it, my reasons was because he's so much older than me. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm 43. He's an elderly man. I spent 77 years, or 77. Sorry, he's 77. Mm-hmm. I spent 17 years working in you know geriatrics. I work in mental health, and I tried for a very long time to downplay the situation to make it okay in my head. Mm-hmm. And there came a point. It was actually um, this summer. Um, my my mental health um, extremely deteriorated, and it was it, like I realized after you know getting some counseling and, and some therapy and talking to people that the root cause of all of the things in my life that just seem you know like everyday life things that people deal with when it happens to me, it seems like it's the end of the world. Like I I live expecting bad things to happen. I expect devastation. I expect to come home and, you know, find my house burnt down or one of my pets dead or, you know, a, a, something happening to my children. Like I I I now live in fear. Wow. But wow. it it really it really took a long time of me rationalizing these things in my head because I tried to like when I tell people the story about Roland Potter from start to finish, I sound like a lunatic. Mm-hmm. I'm the one that sounds crazy. Like I, I I think there's no possible way that I've lived this life for eight years, mm-hmm. and I have. Um, one thing is, uh, and I don't know who was who it was at your house, whether it was you or your your mom, but uh, Sia's dad, Eric, told me about this story of when he first met Potter, he first went to your house thinking that it was Potter's house and met someone who said like, oh, you don't want to go over to that guy's place. He's a bad man. W- was that you or your mom? Or did that, you... that, that was me. I'll, I will never forget the day that I met Eric. T- tell me about that. Um, I was coming home from the gym actually. And it was, I believe it was in November because it was very cold. It was quite likely close to this time of year. And, um, there was no one home and, you know, I, it seems really strange to say this, but when I'm home alone, I'm very anxious. And I mean, I've always, you know, my kids are older now, they're 17, they're more able-bodied than I am. So when they're home, I feel safer. And it seems so weird that when my kids are home, I feel safe. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyways, no one was home that day. And Eric was kind of standing, you know, a little bit beyond my house in front of um, uh, Roland's Quonset hut. And I got out of the vehicle and I kind of looked at him and said, you know, like, hi, can can I help you? Because it's there was no vehicle. There wasn't anything. And and he just started asking me questions about Roland. And at this point in time, the peace bond was in place. And I just explained to him, I said, you know, I'm really sorry. I can't answer any questions about Roland. Like I, I don't speak to him. He's not allowed to speak to me. Um, and then Eric and I kind of chit chatted outside for a minute. And, uh, you know, I just, you know how, when you speak to somebody, even if it's just for the first time, you can kind of you just get this feeling that, it's the right thing to do. And mm-hmm. I just somehow knew that Eric was not a threat to me by no means. Um, so I invited him into the house where it was warm because <laughs> we were freezing outside. Um, so I invited him in and um, we chit chatted for a little bit. And that particular time, that very first meeting, um, Eric didn't actually tell me who he was. Um, we kind of, kind of went our separate ways. And uh, I remember calling my mom after and saying like, I'm not sure who I just met, but it is either Sia's dad, that was my first instinct, Sia's uncle, a good family friend. I said, I, I, I'm not sure, but whoever I just met loves that little girl very, very much. Mm-hmm. It was, yeah. And then it just kind of from there, I, I don't even know how we reconnected, to be honest with you. I think maybe I might have given him my number. And, and at some point, you know, once I realized, you know, that Eric was, uh, you know, wanting answers to what happened to Sia. Um, we just, we're very connected. Wow. Um, now, you had mentioned earlier that, uh, like, uh, you have opinions and thoughts on what actually may have happened in the field that day. Do you care to give your I opinion? Do. Yeah, what, what what do you, like, knowing the people involved and the potters and the way he pr- is protective of his property lines, what, like, what scenario do you see as likely or at least possible having happened? Um, knowing what I know now, I believe he saw Sia in the field and she was on his land 
which is ever so important to him, and he will stop at nothing to protect it. And I believe he saw her, and he ran her over, and he went home. Wow. I think I agree with you at this point for, for certain. But um, I think uh, that was everything I wanted to get into with you. But is there anything we didn't talk about that you think is important to get on the record or anything else you want to share? Any other stories of experiences with Potter? Um, I think... Well, I wrote a victim impact statement um, on June seventh of twenty twenty two that it took. It was I wrote it immediately after um, the incident that took place when Roland attacked my family with the backhoe, um, and unfortunately, I've never gotten to share it. With oh, the I, courts. If, I would but if you have it. I'd it, love it if you'd read it. I have it right here on my phone. Um, it might be a little long winded, but you're welcome to use it whether you choose to or not. But it, it was it was written June 7th of 2022. So I was a little bit younger. <laughs> and this is a statement about uh, the attack on your mom and the rest of your family with this truck. This, this is a, a general statement of what's happened to my family um, in the last few leading up to June 7th of 2022. And I, I wrote it in the hopes that finally uh, you know Roland was going to be held accountable for something that he had done and unfortunately it never happened but yeah I can read it to you Go for it. Um, so I'm 42 years old I have a well-established nursing career I own a home and have raised two sons I shouldn't have to live my life day by day as a result of Mr. Potter's unreasonable destructive dangerous and life-threatening behavior I do I can't plan for my future. I can't feel safe to leave my older teenage sons alone, and I'm in a constant state of anxiety. His behaviors have had devastating effects on our family. Myself and my children have not been able to enjoy our home for the past six years. My sons have been bullied, chased with vehicles, tractors, and a backhoe. One of my sons has been struck with a backhoe bucket. Ethan was struck with the backhoe bucket, and my mother was targeted as well. All done with Mr. Potter operating the backhoe and his wife sitting in side beside him we've been stopped harassed attempts have made to coerce coerce us into confrontation anyone who visits my home whether it's a contractor i've hired for maintenance friends or family have been harassed by mr potter directly or indirectly by his wife vivian potter their continued harassment has led to fights between my son and i lost time at work financial strain on my family and too many anxiety attacks to count I spent the last year, six years making every attempt I could to keep the peace between my family and the Potters. They are relentless. We live under constant surveillance from the Potters. We have on countless occasions been abused. Sorry. They have on countless occasions abused the right of way through my property for the sole purpose of causing my family undue stress. I've spent 32 of my 42 years living in Bear River area and I've always felt safe to leave my house unlocked, my dogs free to roam my yard, and my children safe to be outside. Until buying the home I currently live in, Mr. Potter has taken that sense of security away from my family and I. I've had to install surveillance cameras on my home, which seems completely bizarre to be in such a small community where everyone knows everyone. Mr. Potter makes me feel unsafe in my home. His most recent actions have shown me how far he's willing to go to make other people suffer and afraid of him. Watching the video footage of the backhoe nearly hitting my mom, Ethan being struck, and others being chased with the backhoe has not been easy to handle. It's consumed my life. Every parent lives with a bit of fear that harm could come to the children. It's a reality we're all aware of. Knowing for certain that there is someone specifically targeting, targeting your children to instill fear in them and act in a manner showing them that they will harm them is a type of fear that is difficult to explain in words. Handling that fear is nearly impossible. It has broken me more times than I can count. Mr. Potter's most recent actions have heightened the fear to a level that is interfering with all aspects of my life. I'm unable to focus at work. My mind is constantly wandering to what is going on at home. I can't leave my house without an instant anxiety setting in. As a parent, our first thoughts of the day are to care for our children, their schedule, school. Are they happy in their relationships? Do they need our help with anything? Those are normal parental thoughts. Now my first thoughts of the day are, will they be safe from the monsters who threaten their lives while I attempt to go on as usual? Going to work to make sure they're fed and warm and have the necessities of life. Mr. Potter's made it impossible for us to live normal lives. When I leave the house, I now feel it's necessary to leave instructions on what to do if they're harassed or threatened in any manner. I shouldn't have to have this conversation on a daily basis with, with a 16 and 18 year old. I've taught them at a young age about general life safety, such as fire concern or if someone is accidentally injured. I never imagined 
imagine I would have to have the daily conversation on how to protect their lives, pets, and property from two individuals who set out to destroy them and make them fearful of being alone in their own home in rural Nova Scotia. It's extremely hard for me to understand why all this has happened and to accept that we are at risk of being harmed or worse in our home in Nova Scotia. I'm not a violent, unreasonable person. Mr. Potter has shown me that he will go that he will go after what matters to me the most just to make me suffer. He's attacked my children, my mother, and my pets all over a 50-foot stretch of grass and a driveway that he can't understand he doesn't own. He doesn't have the right to say who can visit me, what we can and can't drive on the driveway I pay a mortgage on. That is our right, and he has taken that away from us. He doesn't have the right to constantly watch and stalk us, make us think twice before we perform a simple task like mowing the lawn or testing test driving a dirt bike, a car, or a four-wheeler that the kids are tinkering with. My children get their happiness from working on engines, figuring out how machines work, how to improve them, make them ready and safe for the road. I'm extremely proud to have raised two children who are capable of those things, rather than sitting in the house with eyes glued to electronics and video games. Mr. Potter has taken the feeling of being proud of them and turned it into a constant fear and anxiety that they will be harmed for doing what makes them happy. We deserve to be happy in the one place on earth that we call home. We deserve to live in peace and not fear for our safety constantly while at home. Home should be a sanctuary, not a place to feel uneasy. Home is the place we all want to go to when life gets rough. At this point, home is nothing more than a shelter for us and a place we have no choice but to go to because there is no other place we can turn into a home. Our home has become a place we feel trapped in because of the unnecessary actions of Mr. Potter and his wife. I can't afford another home and I can't let my mortgage go unpaid. I can't sell the home because of the unreasonable property dispute. Morally, how could I ever sell to another family or another person knowing what they will endure from the potters. I'm a prisoner of sorts in my own home. My children will eventually grow up and move on as long as I continue to reside at Clementsville Road and Mr. Potter owns the land behind me. I have no doubt that my life will be a never-ending state of harassment, fear, and anxiety. I want to thank you for joining Brandy and I for this conversation. When I first learned of Sia's death, it was via the initial news reports which described it as a farming accident. And then I saw the video Brandy filmed of Potter appearing to attack someone with his tractor, and my view of this case completely changed. Now, having spoken with her, I see it's even worse than that one video shows. It's a mess. But you know what else is a mess? The police investigation that followed Sia's death. We'll have a lot more to say about that in the next episode of this series. So I'm going to start wrapping things up here. But before I do, let me give some thanks. First, a big thank you to Brandy for sharing her experiences with the man operating the tractor that killed Sia. I want to thank LJ from the Dystopian Simulation Podcast, who provides the intro and outro voiceovers for this series, as well as Monty Data, who provides the score. And lastly, but most importantly, I have a massive thank you to everyone who listens to Nighttime, as without your interest and your support, this show would be as pointless as it would be impossible. And on the topic of support, let me thank the newest subscribers to the premium feed. Mary, Jana, and Sarah, thank you for going premium. If anyone else would like to support the show, you can access the premium feed at patreon.com slash nighttime podcast, or help the show by simply sharing this episode on social media. If you have any story ideas, if you want to give feedback on the show, or contribute a voice memo to be aired and responded to in an upcoming episode, you can do all that and more at nighttimepodcast.com slash contact. Now, until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and let me know if you see anything weird. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. The Amazon guy dropped off a parcel the other day and he said, hey, aren't you that girl from TikTok with the crazy neighbors? Are you serious? I was like, yeah, that's me. It's like, I recognized your house. Wow. Thank you. That's not a good sign. No, no. I think, I think I've our... applied for a mortgage before and the, when I started describing my house, the lady's like, oh, I know where you live. Yeah, I've watched your videos. Yeah.